So you've received a phone call from the project manager or the service desk manager saying that your firm are doing a takeover job and that you need to go to site and scope the system, see how it works, see how it can be improved, and probably the most important, bring back the faith of the installed system to the customer. When I should go to takeovers, first thing I'd do is see what issues being experienced just to further understand what the problem is on site. So now your job is to start digging for a clearer overview. In my experience, a lot of the time, the majority of problems were resolved within layer one of the OSI model, such as bad cable terminations, poor punch downs on 110 blocks or Euro module outlets, physical networking loops, faulty hardware, just the basics. Wherever possible, I worked the OSI model regardless of the application. Layer one, physical. Verifying your cables is a big part of that, which is very much still a missed procedure. This troubleshooting method can translate to other components of a system, such as a centralized lighting system, which most of the time uses communication methods such as RS-485, where the communication calls were in the wrong polarity and keypads were acting strange. But back to networks, most of the time, the network problems can be resolved due to physical issues, especially in residential environments. On larger scale projects, you can look into issues such as VLAN misconfiguration and spanning tree, should that be applicable. So you've rocked up the site, introduced yourself and then begin to take a look over the system. After getting your bearings to the layout of the property, I used to take a look at the network. I'd open the cupboard door or the comms room door, whichever room the rack was sitting in, and then be welcomed by a big network switch, absolutely no labelling on the cables. Great. So then you'll say, excuse me Mr Smith, is there any documentation on site left by the previous installer? And then from a room somewhere within the labyrinth of this house, you'll hear a weak, no, nope, what's that? So I'm going to now get my tone generator out and start sniffing for some cables. But before I do that, maybe if I log into the switch and see if there are any ports labelled, we need to find the IP address of the switch on the network. We could just go ahead and run an IP network scan, which is perfectly fine, but for this I will utilise ARP. So let's find the core components to the network by using the router's ARP cache, ARP being the address resolution protocol. So ARP is a communication protocol that maps a host device MAC address to an IP address. When a host such as a laptop first connects to the network, it sends out a DHCP discover message to the network, which a DHCP server is actively listening for. The DHCP server in this example is the router. After the DHCP message exchange has been offered, requested and acknowledged, the host now has an IP address. This is known as Dora. The host then sends an ARP request out to check for potential address conflicts and to map the IP address to the MAC address and begin creating an ARP cache table. The ARP request Ethernet frame contains the destination MAC address, which is a block of Fs. The source MAC address, which is obviously the MAC of the requesting host, and the Ether type, which is a hex value of 0x0806. The ARP payload contains the sender or host MAC and IP address and the target IP, but a blank MAC address. When a device responds to that broadcast, it will reply with their MAC address and their IP address, which will create an ARP table on the original host device when received. So on my laptop, if I type in ARP-A, it will display my laptop's ARP cache table of hosts it's found on the network and mapped the IP address to their respective MAC address. So a router may send an ARP request to discover the MAC address of a host on the network. When it does receive the MAC address, it too creates an ARP cache table which we can use to help identify hosts on the network. Most of the time, the router will be on a 1 or 254 host address. So straight away we can go to that. My network is 172.16.25.0 slash 24 network. If I didn't know the IP range, I could connect to the wireless or ethernet and check the default gateway by doing an IP config for Windows or if config on Mac or Linux. <laughs> So we now have the default gateway and we need to log in to begin mapping the network. But how can I log into the router? I don't have the password. Sometimes the customer does have the passwords or you may well know the passwords from previous takeover jobs. Sometimes I'd even phone the previous company and explain what's happening. Most of the time they were happy to supply details or their remote connecting, change the password to something that's more default should they not want to share their admin password, which is understandable. In my case, the previous company hadn't changed the default password. So I'm just going to pretend it's Arachnus Arachnus. So I log into the router and go to the ARP table. We have a Snap AV product at 172.16.25.10 and 11. So let's go to them and see if they're switches. Using the ARP table, we can then begin to create some form of IP addressing sheet and having a copy of the host, device IP and MAC addresses. So I've gone to 172.16.25.10 and on the login page is the model of this switch, which is AN210SW24POE. SW must mean switch, so let's log in and hopefully some ports are labeled. 
are logged in and no ports are labelled either. Excellent. Now let's imagine this house is three storeys, four if you include a basement, where the rack is located and you now need to put your fluke or tone generator at the head end and begin the process of running up and down them stairs many many times and even going in and out of lofts and crawl spaces where other host devices might live. Yes, not a problem, good for cardio, but then you come across a projector three meters high on the ceiling or an 85 inch TV, access points on the ceilings which aren't too bad, a lot of access points I've seen are in accessible locations. But on this site, there are 20 IP cameras. I've seen cameras installed in locations where you think, how on earth did they get that there? I've only got three tread steps on me. How can I map the network if I don't know where anything goes? Now, all network switches have a MAC address table, but managed switches allow you to view that MAC address table. This is a really helpful tool. If the switch on site is unmanaged, you have to ask yourself two questions. Who installs an unmanaged switch as a core switch? And then where is my tone generator? As you're probably out of options there. Now people can get confused between hubs and switches. A switch makes forwarding decisions based on the MAC address table and sends traffic to the correct port. A switch can operate at half or full duplex and can offer port speeds up to 10 gigabit on ethernet and even 100 gigabit on fiber. A switch works at layer two and can also work at layer three of the OSI model. Hubs work at half duplex at a maximum speed of 10100 and is also a layer one device that works at the physical layer of the OSI model. When a hub receives a packet, it sends out all the ports except from the downlink port. So the MAC address table populates based on the MAC addresses it receives from a host connected to a port on the network switch. If there was no MAC address table, the switch would act like a hub and would forward traffic out of all the ports apart from the original incoming port to send traffic destined for a particular device. A network switch then maps each port on the switch to a MAC address of a device and builds a MAC address table. So on my network, I have a 24 port Arachnus network switch and an IP camera. I have no idea what the IP address of the camera is or what port it's on. Luckily, a lot of CCTV manufacturers have discovery tools which can search the network for a camera's IP address. In the case of Hikvision, it's the SADP or Search Active Device Protocol. But this only works if you're on the same LAN as the camera. But let's not get into that just now. What we're doing will suffice. You can do an IP scan using the Angry IP Scanner or Advanced IP Scanner and you get the IP address and MAC addresses. If I use ZenMap and perform a basic network scan, I have a device on the IP address of 172.16.25.100, which is a Hikvision product, and has a MAC address associated with the OUI of that company. If I do a quick OUI lookup with the first 24 bits of that MAC address, it comes back as Hikvision, so that just confirms that. Alternatively, I can go to the router ARP table and find the IP address there. In my Arachnus router, in the ARP table is a Hikvision camera with an IP address of 172.16.25.100 and a MAC address ended in E603. So I have the camera with a MAC address that ends in E603, but I have no idea what port it's connected to on the network switch. So on the network switch, I go to Advanced, Neighbours and MAC address table. Within here, I have four columns, index, port, VID, and MAC address. Index is just to organize the list. Port is what port the MAC address is associated to. VID is what VLAN the port is assigned to. And then we have the MAC address. If I do a command and F or control F on this page and use the last four characters of the MAC address, as most of the time, these are unique characters on the network. So making identification easy. I can see there's a matching MAC address on port 12. Excellent. I can log into the camera, physically see its location. If the camera's not been labeled in its UI, I can call it internal. Then go back and label the port on that switch, making it easy to troubleshoot any future issues that may arise. The next situation is you have a host device on another switch on site. Again, you have no idea what switch is connected to, let alone the port. We can use the same technique to identify ports, but we just need to be aware of a couple of things and perform a couple more steps. When you have a port on switch A connected to a port on switch B, the MAC address will populate on a single port on switch A of the devices on switch B. If I log into the 24 port switch and go to the MAC address table, I can see multiple MAC addresses against port 23, so this can help in identifying the uplink and downlink ports and eventually our hosts we're looking for. But in the art table on the router, I can see a SIP phone named Yaylink at the IP address of 172.16.25.103. And the last digit of his MAC address is B638. If I go to the IP address, I'm welcomed to a login screen for the web UI of the phone. 
back on the 24 port switch, I do a page find and I can see that MAC address is associated with a port that has multiple entries in the switch on port 23. I can then go over to that switch and find the MAC address and the port the host is connected to. So the second switch is on 172.16.25.11. Go to the MAC table and search for the last characters of the MAC address. If you had a switch daisy chain two or three deep, you can use this method to work through the MAC addresses and identify the switch and ports the hosts you need to find are on. I can see here that the phone's on port 4 on this 8 port switch. There are many other entries associated with port 8, that's because that is the port from the 24 port switch. If you don't know the port a downstream switch is on, use the exact same method, log into the switch or switches and find the MAC addresses then search for the MAC in the table. Usually ports with switches attached will show multiple MAC address entries. Then you can work through the MAC address tables until you get to the switch you're looking for. Then label the uplink and downlink ports. The same goes for wireless access points, which work at layer two of the OSI. So you can use MAC addresses. You might see multiple MAC addresses in the MAC address table associated to a single port. Again, working through the MAC addresses, you can identify a wireless access point and the device associated with it. If I go to my router's ARP table and find the access point, make a note of the last four characters of the MAC address, go to the switch and find the MAC. I can see another entry on the same port, which is my Roku media player I have here. But more importantly, we've found the port that the access point is connected to. So we can go ahead and label that up. Using the MAC address table is a great way to find the ports a cable is connected to. It's helped me out many times over the years when a switch or cabling hasn't been labelled. Another good benefit of the MAC table is finding the correct port should you need to reboot a device that's using PoE but isn't labelled up anywhere, so something like a camera. This is a really basic troubleshooting procedure one could use to help identify devices on a network that you're not familiar with. It may take some time, but surely it's better than trying to get your phone camera on top of a projector looking for the MAC address or behind a TV or struggling to get to a camera location.